Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, today, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about going back to the basics, but in uh, an interesting way. Uh, the lecture is called, the talk is called Modern React, the Essentials. And a little bit about myself, um, like Benjamin said, I'm the client architect in Duda. Uh, I'm the web architect. And in Duda, what we do is we build a web design platform for professionals. Web design platform for, for professionals. Uh, basically, it's a website builder that uh, is uh, aimed at agencies and big agencies that build hundreds or thousands of websites every month. A little bit else about myself is that I'm currently in an analog astronaut program training for the, um, it's called the Austrian Space Forum, uh, to be an analog astronaut in Europe. And uh, one thing that you may know is that this year is the 50th anniversary of landing on the moon. For those reasons, our talk would be modern React Essentials, but in a nicer way, we'll talk about React above and beyond. OK, so uh, if you read the description, you probably noticed portals, hooks, suspense. And you might ask yourself, what is the connection between all of these portals? That's not React Next. That's more like React Prev, right? But um, I believe that in every framework, everything that you use, you have to know your tools. You have to know what you're using. You have to know the API that was released two years ago, the API that was released five months ago, and the API that will be released two months from now. So uh, Abraham Lincoln once said, if I had eight hours to chop, an, to chop a tree, I'd spend six sharpening my X. And I say, if I had six hours to sharpen an X, I'll check carefully where the sharp side is. So let's dive straight into portals. Um, you might know a little bit what portals are. Um, actually, Wikipedia defines portals as a technological or magical doorway. I like this definition. That connects two distance locations separated by space time. And how does React define portals? Well, React portals are um, a way to render children into a DOM node that exists outside of the DOM hierarchy. And if you highlight only the important parts, it's basically render children outside of the parent. The first thing that you have to ask yourself when you see a new API, or in that case, an existing API, is why? Why do we need this API? Well, let's go a little bit backwards. How do we render React containers now? Or how, do we, how did we render before portals? So we had the render method, right, by React DOM, because React itself doesn't care where you render the children. React DOM uh, takes care of the DOM itself. And let's say you wanted to render an astronaut, and the astronaut is uh, um, built with some parts. So you would render um, the, the astronaut, then you'd render its helmet, then you'd render its suit, then you render its boot, boots, and that's it, right? That's React DOM render, that's uh, basic React rendering. What happens now if you want to add a companion to the astronaut? You want to add something that would float beside him. Then someone would come and add mooncake to the astronaut, and then you'd render mooncake, which is nice. Um, if you look at the DOM, you would see that all of the parts, all of the things that were inside the, the render tree are rendered in the same DOM container, right? We have the helmet, we have mooncakes, we have the suits, and we have the boots. So how come we see mooncake outside of the container? The answer is simple, CSS, right? We put it in position absolute. And that's not, not an uncommon use case. Uh, we have model, models in the real world. We have uh, sidebars. We have dropdowns. We have a lot of elements that we want to render outside of the container, but in the same component tree. What would happen if tomorrow someone will come and add to, to the astronaut overflow hidden? In that case, mooncake, with all the sadness, will disappear, right? Because it is overflown from the div. How can we solve this issue? One possible solution is to render different component trees in different containers. So just invoke React on render for both of the containers. The problem here is that if we, add, if we render an astronaut in a spaceship, we have to have some sort of controller that controls the events and the props between those two, because those are different DOM containers, different React trees. So we have to have some sort of this, uh, this controller. But this controller is very hard to implement, and if you tried tried writing a sidebar or a dropdown before portals or a model, you'd know that it's really hard to connect those two. And if something goes wrong, then goodbye, astronaut. Uh, you, don't, you lose this, this connection between those two containers. So the ultimate solution that React provides us is to use Create Portal. Create Portal allows us to render the same component tree in different containers. How does it work? Let's see. OK, let's say um, we have Earth, and Earth wants to render people, but it also wants to render an astronaut on Mars. Don't worry if you don't know this syntax. This is just a sugar for React fragment. Um, uh, it allows us to render um, several components uh, with, without a container. 
So let's put Earth and Mars. We have Earth and Mars on the screen. And now we start to render. So the first person is rendered on Earth, the second one on Earth. And then we reach the Create Portal. And Create Portal, even though it's in the same render flow, renders the astronaut on Mars and not on Earth. The third person will be rendered on Earth. And if we take a look at the DOM, you would see that we have two containers, Earth and Mars, even though it's the same container tree, the same uh, children, uh, they were rendered in two different containers. It goes even further. Events from the remote container are propagated into the parent container. So for example, if on Earth we have an on-click handler, uh, again, don't worry if you don't know this syntax, that will be covered later, or probably you know it, um, that's hooks. Use state, right, yeah. So don't worry if you know this syntax, it's a typo. Uh, it's supposed to be use state, yeah. Um, thank you. So what happens if someone would click on the astronaut? If we click on the astronaut, the Earth will receive this click, even though it's in a different DOM container, just because it's in the same, um, the same render tree. And in that case, it will set the world to hello, and we'll get the props propagated into different containers. It goes even further. The Earth doesn't need to know that it's a portal. The astronaut component can actually create a portal in its own render, and the Earth just renders astronaut on Mars, and it doesn't need to know that it's a portal. More than that, if the astronaut on Mars would decide to render a spaceship, that spaceship will be rendered on Earth and not on Mars, right? Because it's the same, the same flow. So only create portal creates uh, remote containers. More than that, astronaut on Mars doesn't need to use an existing container. It can create its own. It can just create, again, this is hook. Um, it's use effect. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, uh, it can create its own and just render inside it. And more than that, it can open a different window, create a container in that window, and render the astronaut in that container. And the nice thing is that Earth doesn't need to know about it. It just renders astronaut on Mars, and astronaut on Mars creates the portal where, where it wants. So to sum up create, uh, React portals, so this is a React DOM API. It's not related to React itself, but to where it's rendered. It should be called during render, um, even though calling functions during render uh, is a sort of, I don't know, a code smell or a bad pattern. This one should be called during render. It renders the same tree in different containers. And props, events, and context, context state are shared between those containers. OK, that was portal. Let's continue to concurrent React. So concurrent React, um, uh, basically it's a, it's, a new, uh, it's a new way. It's a new way that the React engine is built. It's also the parallel talk that is going in whole A. So we're doing it concurrently. It's nice. And it's a complete rewrite of uh, React's rendering engine. And I know what you're thinking. Where can I get it? Well. The nice thing is, it's already in the engine. So Andrew Clark gave a really good talk in React Conf um, a couple months ago. This talk was a little bit shadowed uh, uh, by the, 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 the uh, proposal of hooks. But Andrew Clark gave a talk about concurrent React. It's really, uh, it's really recommended. And basically, concurrent React is a way to solve the problems that happen in CPU or I.O. intensive apps. Um, it means that. Uh, if, you, if you saw, uh, Dan Abramov um, made a great demo about how React act, acts when it needs to update a lot of uh, components in the DOM. So in that case, you can see this is the concurrent mode. In the concurrent mode, it just updates smoothly, more or less. But uh, if you go to the synchronous mode, you can see that it's really hard to type. When you type, it renders, renders hundreds of components in the DOM. And it also needs to update the user input, and the thread gets stuck. And you can see in the frustration met meter that uh, it's a bad user experience. So concurrent mode allows you to bypass all that, and we'll see how. Concurrent mode allows you to work on multiple tasks and switch between them according to priority. That's something that um, JavaScript and functions in JavaScript usually can't really do, right? Uh, functions in JavaScript usually run. It, it's called run to completion. Uh, you, you have to finish the function, you have to finish the render before you can uh, continue to the next one. And it's meant to solve those kinds of problems, where you have multiple spinners uh, in a screen, or where you put a spinner just to load something, and you have a fast network, and then you have a flicker of a spinner, 
and, uh, and then you see the, the content. So how does it work? First, let's review how the, um, how the stack reconciler, reconciler, how the synchronous mode works. So let's say we have a solar system. And in the solar system, we want to render different planets. So React starts by taking the thread uh, and saying, OK, I want to render those, uh, those children. And it doesn't really know how much time it's going to take, right? I mean, every, every child can be um, very uh, computationally hard, uh, computationally heavy. So it renders Mercury, for example. Then it continues to the next one. It renders Venus. And then it renders Earth. And maybe in that case, the browser says, hey, there's an urgent DOM change. I need to change something in the DOM. The thread is stuck. The thread is stuck rendering uh, the, the previous elements. So it's busy. It's, it, it can't release the, the thread. It can't yield the thread to the browser. So it's just continuing, continuing to render. And it renders Mars and its moons. And then it renders the asteroid belt that can have a lot of asteroids. And again, you have an urgent animation. Someone scrolled, or, or an animation came, and you need to display it on the screen, but you can't because the thread is busy rendering and committing those to the DOM. So it's still busy. You continue rendering. And then you have a user input that you need to show in an input field. Again, cannot. I'm busy. So you render Jupiter, you render Saturn, and only then everything is committed to the DOM, and only then the thread is released. Only then the browser can continue doing um, what it needs to do. So what happens in concurrent mode? In concurrent mode, we have the same flow, but since we're using something that's called um, fiber reconciler, which, which we'll talk uh, in a second, uh, we can do something else. We can render Mercury, but not commit it to the DOM, just render it in memory. Um, we can render Venus, not commit it to the DOM. We can render Earth, not commit to the DOM, and then you have an urgent animation. And since, we're not since we have a way to pause rendering, we, we're not committing to the DOM, we're just rendering in memory, and we have a way to pause it, we can yield the thread back to the browser, pause the rendering, do the animation, and then continue. So we continue rendering, and for example, now we render the asteroid belt, and now we have a user input, we're pausing the rendering, and maybe the user input changed the number of asteroids that we need to render. So we go back and we start rendering everything again and maybe adding some more asteroids. And by the way, that's the reason why um, component will mount uh, is something that it's deprecated or um, uh, it's unsafe because component will mount will run on every render even if, the, uh, even if it's not committed to the DOM. So it's possible to run component will mount multiple times while component did mount will run only after it's committed to the DOM. So we continue rendering, and only after everything is ready, all of this tree is committed to the DOM. OK, so what's the difference between the stack reconciler and the fiber reconciler? Again, the fiber reconciler is already in React. So the stack reconciler, uh, like we said, like we know stacks of functions in JavaScript. It has to render everything by order. It's recursive. And fiber reconciler can actually render some elements. And if the element is not ready, it just says, OK, I'm not ready. So it renders its siblings. And it can, it, can, it can also say, wait, I need to do something else. And then pause it and come back to it and then try to render again the first thing that wasn't ready and render another thing. And basically, it can, it can, just, it can just play with the order of rendering. Uh, it's called, since it's using fibers, and fibers, it's a concept of uh, um, something that can stop in the middle and yield to a, to a general uh, controller and then resume. Um, so only when everything is ready, it's committed, committing to the DOM. So it's basically just juggling all the components. How do we do that? We just said that JavaScript doesn't allow us to stop functions in the, in the middle. Well, we do it by throwing promises. And that's something uh, that's uh, it's very, I, I recommend reading uh, the internals of Fiverr, how, how it's done. But basically, components can throw promises. And then those promises can resume. Uh, and that way, we can stop um, rendering components in the middle. So we can already use some of that uh, in the form of suspense, suspense and lazy. Uh, you probably know that. First, what is a suspender? So a suspender is everything that can pause render tree. It can, uh, it can say, wait, I want to pause this render, and I want, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for code, or I'm waiting, I'm waiting for data. There's something that I need, and I need to pause it. So React provides us two ways to pause a render tree. Uh, if you wait for code, you can use lazy. If you wait for data, you can use React cache. 
So how do you use it? You just import lazy from React. You can do it today. It's already uh, stable. You can uh, uh, use lazy, and you have to pass lazy some sort of uh, promise, uh, something that returns a promise. For example, an import statement by, uh, um, if you're using Webpack, it knows to import lazily this component, Mars.js6, and then you can use it synchronously in your render. So just see what I did here. I'm using Mars, if Elon Musk is true. I'm rendering Mars, and I don't care if it's there or not. Just try to remember how we did it before lazy. We had to uh, uh, do a set state, and then set it to null, and then try to fetch it, and when it gets, we set it to something, and then we render. Here you just use it, just use it like that. So what happens if I try to, uh, to run this code? I get an exception. Why do I get an exception? Because React says, OK, I have a suspender. I have a lazy. I saw that you're rendering lazy. But I don't know what to do until it, it arrives. You don't have something that would catch this suspense. So in React, we have a suspense block, which is basically like a catch block for suspenders. And suspense, again, is something that you can use today. And in suspense, you just wrap suspenders and then you tell, it, you tell React, OK, until those suspenders are resolved, this is what I want you to do. So you can see that I wrapped my suspender, Mars, which is lazily loaded. I wrapped it in a, in a suspense uh, block. And the result of it will be something like that. So to suspense, you provide a fallback, what to do until the, the suspender is, is resolved. So Earth will be rendered synchronously, since it's a sync uh, import, it's a static import and Mars will show a spinner until it is resolved. Let's say I don't want to do that. Let's say I, want to, I don't want to display the solar system at all until all of my components arrive. I don't, don't want a lot of spinners. I can just put Earth inside of Suspense as well, so Suspense can contain even uh, uh, synch synchronous uh, children. And then I, I see only one spinner for the entire solar system until Mars is resolved. Is that it? That's all, just a glorified spinner. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Well, not exactly. That's what you can use right now, but um, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And now we're marching into a little bit uh, unstable, unstable territory. Um, if we want to use the entire, to unleash the entire power of concurrency, we have to render it in a, a special way. And you can see that all of the methods now are gonna be prefixed in unstable. So to render a concurrent root, to use concurrent React, we have to render it using unstable create root, and then call render on it. And you can see, this is from uh, um, Andrew Clark presentation, you can see that the behavior is different. So notice on the left you have the sync mode, on the right you have the concurrent mode, and you can see that the same code generates a spinner on the left side and doesn't generate it on the concurrent side. Why? Since React is using concurrency, since it can pause rendering in the middle, it doesn't have to show something. It can say, OK, I'm waiting for data or I'm waiting for code to arrive, and only then I show the tree. I don't need to show your spinner. I can wait a little bit and then, uh, then show it. So uh, we can, if, we, if we're using concurrent mode, we can also use something that's called scheduling. We can tell React, hey, this operation is high priority. Do it immediately. This is a little bit low priority. Uh, wait for it. And this is how Dan actually uh, built its demo, uh, if you remember. If it's a sync mode, it just sets states. And if it's async mode, it's called the scheduler and says, OK, this is not that important um, when, I'm, when I'm typing. Wait before you update the DOM. Update the input field, because I want to have uh, an immediate response. But wait before you update the DOM. Another thing that we can use is React Cache. Again, it's something that's unstable. And that, that prevents this kind of behavior when you have components that each component renders its own spinner just waiting for the data. Okay, so this is a common pattern, uh, waiting for the data. While the data is null, just show spinner. Well, React allows us to create React Cache, which is a suspender just like lazy. It's like lazy, but for data. And we're just using it to uh, something that's called create resource. And then we can use it synchronously. So just uh, watch in the function uh, planet data. I'm using get planet data synchronously and using the data even though the data didn't arrive yet because React knows to suspend and only when the data arrives, continue rendering. So we can avoid this kind of issue if we use uh, the suspenders. So this kind when you have uh, multiple spinners, just see what I, what I did here. I, I took Earth and Mars, those are lazily loaded and I'm using the planet data that I showed earlier to lazily load data and since everything is wrapped in suspense, we don't see spinners 
but we just see everything at once. Uh, we see the planets, we see their data, and yeah, population one. Okay, so to sum up suspense, uh, we have what we call time slicing. Uh, that's what we discussed in the first, uh, in the beginning. It's a, it's a way to do non-blocking rendering and coordinate multiple operations by priori priority. You can tell React what kind of priority you want for your operations. And you have suspense. Suspense is a way to access async data or async components and pause component render and then run it again. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Let's talk about hooks. Okay. Uh, probably most of you are familiar with hooks. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick primer and then talk about it a little bit. Um, hooks, they were like the big announcement in React Conf uh, 2019. People uh, actually referred to this, this talk by then a little bit as people referred to this speech by JFK. Um, hooks were like the thing that's going to change React. And about a day after Dan said in React Conf, this is in beta, please don't use it in production. This is still going to change. You could have seen a lot of blog posts, like uh, why React's new hooks uh, API is a game changer. And uh, even Ken C. Dodd says, OK, I want to write a new React component, but hooks are not stable yet, so I don't know what to do. Um, so you could see how much the React community was starving for new API for something, uh, something fresh. But you, s you already saw some uh, issues, like state from use state is inside state timeout is not updated. And those issues were actually, were actually responded by, this is a subtle but expected behavior. Because you have to understand hooks, you have to understand the difference between using hooks and using classes before you use them. So Dan wrote uh, Making Sense of React Hooks. And in the end, it says, spread love, not hype. And uh, this is, if you remember something, one thing from this talk, this is what you need to remember. Don't follow the hype. Understand what you're using. Understand the sharp side. And another quote um, that Many of the truths depend on our point of view. If you love hooks or hate hooks, it all depends on how you look at it. This is by Yoda, not me and Abraham Lincoln. So let's dive quickly into understanding hooks. Since I already used the why GIF, I can't use it again, but I can show a suspicion matter, starting from a round earth at the bottom and a flat earth at top. And this meter will help us to understand how weird is the behavior that we see now in hooks. OK, so why? Why hooks? Everything began uh, at the time of the classes versus functions will why classes versus functions? Well, classes in React are too complicated. We can agree on that. We can agree on that because I'm speaking and I'm saying that we can agree on that. This is confusing. This is confusing. Its value changes. changes. It's confusing for men. It's confusing for, for machines. Uh, you have to wrap different logic in the same lifecycle uh, life method. So component did mount subscribe to events. Component did unma uh, will unmount unsubscribe for, uh, from events, but those are grouped by lifecycle and not by logic. On the other hand, functions were too simple. I had a function, it was a pure function. I can't really use state, I can't re-render that component when I want. They were too simple for our use cases. So maybe we were looking for a solution in the wrong places. Um, when React released hooks, it let you use state without writing a class, which is nice. So let's just review what are we missing from classes. Well, basically, we miss this, right? We miss some sort of, um, of a reference that stays between the runs of the functions. So we want to use state. We want a way to declare side effects. And we want uh, memorization or some sort of uh, memory between runs of the functions. So React actually provide us, provides us with that. Uh, use state, use effect, use ref. Um, those are only five hooks. Uh, there are five or six uh, more built-in hooks. And I really recommend reading on all of them. Let's see a quick example. Let's say I have a spaceship. I want to render a spaceship. And that's a stateless component. It doesn't have any state. It gets its location from the props. OK. And now I want to, uh, my boss tells me, OK, I, need, I want to add controls to the ship. I want the ship to be able to control itself. So I'm just adding a controls. But now I'm stuck, right? Because I don't have a state. I don't have anything to, that th these controls can control other than sending uh, callbacks back up. So I'm adding use state. Use state is a new is a hook using state. I give it the initial value, and it returns me the state value and the updater function. And I can use this state value. It will all, always be up to date. And the updater function will always trigger the re-render. So that's a way to use state inside of functions. So notice that all the hooks start with use. This is the convention. And use state is the basic and I think uh, the, the most useful one. 
So now let's say I want to have two states. I want x-axis and y-axis. So I just call use state twice. And in that case, it's important to understand that the order is important. And we can see that our suspicion meter is high. Why is the order important? What's on the sort of magic going uh, underneath the hood? Well, Adam Klein gave a good uh, explanation in his talk, Under the Hook. And you can see that it's not really magic. Uh, the, the reason that you need to do it in order is just really careful bookkeeping or hook keeping. Um, and you can, actually, uh, you can actually write use state in like 10 lines of code. Uh, it's, not that, uh, it's not that magical. So OK, let's say that we want to update the window title whenever the ship's location is changed. So if you put this line, the window title will be updated on every render, even if the ship location hasn't changed, right? Because it's just a function. It just reruns. So we wrap it in something that's called use effect. Use effect um, allows us to give a function and, and dependencies. And basically, it says, run this function for the first render, and whenever those dependencies change. So it's something like uh, component did mount um, and component uh, did update without us needing to compare the, the values. OK, now if we don't want to control using the controls, but using the mouse, we can just add another effect that says add event listener to mouse move. And this is OK, but this, again, will run every time. It will add a new event listener every time, because we have to remember functions run every render. That's the kind of switch in, in mindset that you need to do. Functions run on, run on every render. Um, so we just uh, cheat, and we give it uh, empty dependencies, meaning it will run only on first render. So it's like a component did mount. Uh, we also need to provide a cleanup function. So in order to provide that, we extract the, we extract the function uh, outside, and we provide a cleanup function that says, OK, remove this event, uh, event listener when the component unmounts. If you look carefully, you see a problem here, because the function handle mouse moves change on every render. Again, it creates the same function on every render. Uh, so the add event listener and the remove event listener would look at two different, in two different instances of this function. So. We're confused, right? Uh, but there's a solution. Hook Skywalker. Um, OK, so we just use something that's called use callback. Use callback is guaranteed to give us the same instance of a function as long as its dependencies doesn't change. So we just use callbacks. And here we're already frustrated and say, OK, hooks are hard. Why do we need that? Well, let's see the benefits that we gain from hooks. So we have the separation of concerns. We have one effect to change the window title. We have one effect to control the mouse listener, the add event listener, remove event listener. But did we really have separations of, con on, of concerns? All we wanted is to render a ship, and we have a whole, this whole bunch of code. Well, that's a nice thing. Hooks are just code. You can just ex extract them. We can just extract the code to something that's called custom hook, which is use location. It doesn't know anything about render. It just uses the hooks logic. And the spaceship can just use this custom hook, which is nice. OK, so custom hooks are everywhere. You can have a custom hook, uh, custom hook to, uh, to do this kind of spring animation, which is very complicated. But you have one line, use spring, and that's it to do this kind of animation. You can have a custom hook to do uh, pr uh, animated progress bar, just use progress, and that's it. You have uh, plenty of custom hooks already created. OK, then um, a few uh, takeaway points from this. Uh, you have to adopt a functional mindset. You have to remember that everything is recreated when the function is running. Uh, so just use hooks to, to return the same instance uh, instead of creating functions all over again. Um, well, the functions will be created. When you call use callback and pass it an inline function, the function will be created, but what you receive from the use callback will be the same instance every time. You should opt in to save refs between renders. It's not like in classes you have this. Here you don't have this. You have to use something that's called use ref. Use ref gives you something that's like this that you can store references that will uh, be kept between renders. And you have to remember, that's very important, that functions close over values. So for example, if you do this set timeout inside a function, the alert will alert the name at the time of the creation of this function, and not the, the updated name after three seconds. That's important, because in classes we had this, and this is always updated. But here you have to remember the functions close over values. And then even wrote a complete guide to use effect, which is 50 minutes read. But it's worth reading just to understand what you're using. Um, so it's important to know the subtle differences between hooks and classes. Used correctly, uh, hooks can actually uh, increase the uh, reuse of code, increase the predictability of code. Um, 
And it's a really good addition to the language, but you have to know how to use them. So use force hook. Yeah. OK, so let's wrap up uh, quickly. We didn't reach to the moon <laughs> in this talk, but we did talk about a little bit of the past of React, right, portals. We talked a little bit about the present, which is hooks. And we talked a little bit about the future, which was the concurrent React, the concurrent rendering. And the main takeaway from this talk is understand the tools that you're using. Understand the old APIs, understand the current APIs, and understand what is going to come in order to use it effectively. Thank you.